Hello, my name is Andy Nguyen Fan. Today we'll be discussing a 1991 paper by Lee and Goldfarb. They were investigating the exact repression mechanism of the LAC operon by LAC I. For those who have access to it, we'll be looking at figures 6.8 and 7.8 from the 5th edition of Molecular Biology by Robert Weaver. This video was made for MCDP 427, the Molecular Biology class at the University of Michigan. Let's begin. Before we can discuss the experiment, let us first establish the general mechanism for transcription as background. Transcription is the process that takes the genetic information stored in DNA and produces an RNA copy of it. This process utilizes the enzyme RNA polymerase to accomplish this task. Transcription can be broken down into three parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. In this video, we'll focus mainly on the initiation component of transcription. Here is a diagram that presents the general overview of the four steps of initiation, so let's go into further detail of each individual step. We begin with the gene and the enzyme RNA polymerase. As we can see, the enzyme has a component attached to it called the sigma factor, here in blue. This factor is responsible for identifying specific sequences called promoters in the gene so that it can begin transcription. As such, we consider sigma to be the specificity factor as it directs RNA polymerase to start transcription. As a result of this guidance, RNA polymerase is able to bind loosely to the DNA and produce a closed promoter complex. In order to proceed to the next step, the, this closed promoter complex needs to be converted into the open variant of the promoter complex. Here is a figure that demonstrates how this complex conversion process occurs. The closed component is derived from the fact that the double-stranded DNA is closed off from direct binding with RNA polymerase. In order for the complex to be converted into the open form, the sigma factor stimulates the core enzyme to melt the D two DNA strands at the promoter and expose the DNA template strand to RNA polymerase. With the strands no longer closed off, the RNA polymerase can begin with the initiation process of transcription. Now back to initiation. RNA polymerase begins to incorporate the first few nucleotides into the template strand, template strand, as seen here, and forms the first phosphodiester bonds. At this time, we see that RNA polymerase has not left the promoter yet and remains firmly attached to it. At this point, the complex is in its initial transcribing form. Also, we begin to, the, begin to observe the production of these small oligonucleotides called abortive transcripts, seen here, while RNA polymerase remains attached to the DNA. The DNA. These abortive transcripts average around 9 to 10 nucleotides in length, and it's still unclear what function these abortive transcripts serve. Finally, there comes to a point where enough nucleotides have been added to form a long enough hybrid complementary to the DNA template. Once this event happens, the transcription complex has been stabilized enough that RNA polymerase no longer needs to be remained attached to the promoter. The sigma factor leaves the complex, and RNA polymerase can begin the elongation component of transcription. The promoter, comp cl the promoter clearance step is now over. Let us move on to an example in a biological system and the topic of our paper, the LAC operon. Here is a diagram that presents the LAC operon in its entirety. The LAC operon is a system of genes that are responsible for the transport and, met and metabolism of lactose in E. coli. One of the components of the LAC operon that the paper was interested in was the LAC I gene. It is responsible for coding a for a repressor monomer that combines with itself to form a tetramer product. This tetramer binds to the operator LACO and prevents transcription of the downstream genes. If RNA polymerase is bound to LACP, the promoter region, as seen here, it cannot continue on transcribing due to this blockage. Now that we have addressed the background, we can now return to the topic of the experiment. The researchers Lee and Goldfarb were curious about the exact mechanism of repression for the LAC operon. I will now hand it off to Thomas to discuss these details. The question that we're trying to answer right now is how does the LAC repressor actually do its job? So here we've got a model of the LAC operon. We have our promoter here in green, the operator in red, and the LAC Z gene and so on here in this sort of tan brown color. We know that transcription will occur when RNA polymerase is able to come here and bind to the promoter forming an open complex and then proceed with transcription. Our question is, what happens when the LAC I, this, this repressor, comes in and binds to the operator? Is it the case that the repressor blocks the binding of RNA polymerase? In which case, you would just see that RNA polymerase is unable to even bind to the promoter? Or 
does the repressor block transcription elongation, in which case RNA polymerase would be able to bind to the promoter, it just would not be able to actually create a transcript. So now we're going to talk about the actual experiments done by Lee and Goldfarb in 1991 that investigated whether or not the repressor blocked RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter or whether it simply blocked elongation. To investigate this, they performed a runoff transcription assay, which basically has as its goal to assess the transcription levels of a particular gene of interest, or more importantly for us, to assess the potency of a promoter, here the LAC operon promoter, so the LAC promoter. So how does this assay work? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to actually isolate your promoter and your gene of interest. So if we have here the E. coli genome, what we can do is we can make two cuts, one just a little bit upstream of the promoter here, and one in the middle of the Z gene. What this gives us is it gives us a small 123 base pair long fragment of DNA that consists of our control elements here, control, as well as a fragment of the LAC Z gene here. What we can now do is in a test tube, we can add in the repressor for 10 minutes. We let the repressor incubate for 10 minutes. And at the end of this 10 minutes, we're going to see the repressor bind very stably, very strongly here to the operator. Next, we can add into this test tube RNA polymerase. And this is where things get really interesting because we're going to have RNA polymerase floating around in solution. And the question is, what happens here at the promoter? The first possibility is that RNA polymerase does not bind. So does not bind. In this situation, RNA polymerase is going to be floating around in solution, but the repressor will block binding. What we can do next is we can add in heparin, and heparin is an anionic polysaccharide. So that basically means that it has a bunch of negative charges on it. Now RNA polymerase is actually a cationic protein, which means it has positive charges. So all the RNA polymerase that is floating around in solution will be scavenged, bound to, by heparin, which will block it from initiating transcription and thus binding to DNA. So all the RNA polymerase that is not bound to DNA already will be bound to heparin. Next, we can add in two things. We can add in NTPs, nucleotide triphosphates, and our inducer, IPTG. So importantly, one of these NTPs has to be radio labeled so we can actually visualize what we're doing. We're gonna radio label CTP. And the inducer, IPTG, its main job is to come here, bind to the repressor, cause a conformational shift, which releases the repressor from the operator. So the inducer makes sure that the repressor leaves the operator. So now we've just got this blank piece of DNA, which is great, except that because we don't have any RNA polymerase bound to the promoter, you actually don't get any transcription of this gene which means that at the end of this process, we get no radio-labeled runoff transcripts. The other possibility is that RNA polymerase does bind to the promoter, and indeed it forms an open complex. In this situation, we still have RNA polymerase floating around out here, but some of it will have bound to the promoter. Now when we add in heparin, We'll block all of these free-floating RNA polymerases from binding, but you can't actually rip away this RNA polymerase that is already bound because it has formed an open complex. And open complexes are very stable. It's very difficult to rip this away once it's actually melted the DNA. Now when we add our NTPs and our IPDG, you get the removal of the repressor, and now RNA polymerase in an open complex is all set to transcribe our gene. At the end of this process, we will see the production of radio-labeled transcripts, here with the C being uh, our radio-labeled CTP. So what did the authors actually find? 
So, to recap, the authors wanted to figure out whether or not RNA polymerase was, in fact, able to bind to the LAC promoter, even in the presence of repressor. As a quick aside, you'll see that in the figure it mentions LAC-R here. LAC-R is the name for the repressor protein that's coded for by the LAC-I gene. So when you see LAC-I and LAC-R, we can interpret them both as repressor. So to answer this question, the authors performed the experiment I just described, and they performed it in three different ways, as is evident by these three different lanes in this figure. The first lane corresponds to an experiment where they took the LAC promoter, they added an RNA polymerase immediately without any repressor present, after which they added heparin to scavenge any free-floating RNA polymerase, and then your radio-labeled NTPs. And then when they ran this gel, they were able to visualize the radio-labeled RNA transcripts, and they found that there were these two large, heavy bands up here at the top of the gel. These correspond to large runoff transcripts. So this indicates that RNA polymerase was able to bind, and then it was able to do transcription elongation, resulting in a large RNA molecule. We also see down here at the bottom these smaller bands, these correspond to those abortive transcripts we mentioned earlier. Recall that abortive transcripts are a normal part of transcription initiation. They implied that RNA polymerase was able to bind and form an open complex, and then proceed to create these small seven nucleotide long RNA fragments. In lane two, the authors did the same thing, except this time what they did is they added in the LAC-I repressor before adding in RNA polymerase. So in lane two, we see that the repressor has bound, and they found that there were no significant runoff transcripts formed, which is to be expected because we've added in the repressor, and we have not added in the inducer, right? There's no IPTG down here. So there's nothing to remove the repressor, unless we get no runoff transcripts. However, intriguingly, we do see the formation here of these abortive transcripts once again. So this indicates that RNA polymerase was able to bind, form an open complex with the promoter, and create these abortive transcripts, but it wasn't actually able to get past the repressor and form a full runoff transcript. In lane three, the authors performed the same experiment as in lane two, except this time, they did add in the inducer at the end of the experiment. So, when they added in the LAC-I, the repressor here, it bound to the operator and blocked RNA polymerase from actually transcribing, from, from elongating a transcript, but RNA polymerase was in fact still able to bind, as is evidenced by these abortive transcripts down here. Then when they added in NTPs and the inducer, this inducer alleviated the repressor so the repressor left, and that RNA polymerase that had bound was in fact able to proceed with transcription elongation. So the potential mechanism of repression at this point seems to be that when we have no repressor, we form these abortive transcripts, and RNA polymerase is actually going to be able to transcribe the full gene, and we get our mRNA. But when you see the repressor being bound, we see still abortive transcripts being made, indicating that RNA polymerase binds, forms an open complex, but it's just unable to get past this repressor. It's unable to elongate. So to summarize what we talked about in this presentation, RNA polymerase is able to bind to and form an open complex with the promoter of the lac opron, even in the presence of repressor. The repression that we see may be due, in fact, to the repressor blocking transcription elongation, as we still see the creation of small abortive transcripts, indicating that initiation does, in fact, occur. Once we add in our inducer, either IPTG or allolactose, then the repression is lifted, which allows any already bound RNA polymerase to proceed with elongation. However, this study was not without major limitations the most significant of which was that the conditions used did not mimic physiological conditions, namely they were in vitro, and the amount of protein used was too substantial. 
Future studies did demonstrate that in physiological conditions, RNA polymerase is unable to bind to the promoter in the presence of repressor. Thank you very much for watching, and go blue!